Good evening and welcome to the October 27th, 2022 Infrastructure Oversight Board meeting. Um, can we please stand for the flag salute? Let me begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Could I please get a roll call? Sure. Um, board member Albazian? Present. Uh, board member Brennan? Present. Board member Coronado? Not present for record. Uh, board member Jack uh, Richel? Present. Board member Vanderbort? Not here for the record. Vice Chair Jackson? Here. Present. Chair Takahashi? Present. Thank you. That concludes the roll call. Great. Thank you. Do we have any announcements this evening? We do have David Donahue in person. Um, this is regarding IA Metro. That's public comment, right? Yeah, so I'm yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah, so this would be, st yeah. Do we have any staff announcements tonight? Nothing from staff. Oh, okay, great. Then we shall move on to public comment. Um, do we have any public comments tonight? Yes, we have David Donahue uh, regarding IE Metro. Thank you, David. Yeah, you can stand at the lectern, sure. It's a lot different than uh, coming to the Dias at City Council, so thank you very much for the guidance and the help. Um, Chair Taguchi, thank you very much for your um, welcome earlier, and all to the board members, thank you very much for your service. Um, I'm here in the capacity as one of the board members of Vision Burbank, and regarding the Metro's plan to take two full lanes out of all, from all of all, all of Avenue between Buena Vista and First. Um, we were very supportive as an organization of the city's letter to the Metro Board, and we support that very much. And as you are putting this item on your agenda, I would very much hope that you keep in mind some of the wishes and of, the, of the residents of Burbank that we are against the proposed Metro plan to remove two full lanes. We are for mixed flow until they can get the ridership numbers up to what they indicated they would be. Thank you very much. Thank you. No more public comment. Are there any public comments online or on the phone? No, Chair. No public comment on the phone. Okay, great. Thank you. So that concludes our public comment. Do we have any a brief board member response to public comment? I agree with the gentleman. I don't want to see any lanes gone. There's only, okay, we, we have theoretically four lanes, but two of them are for parking. So if you take a, a one or two lanes away, what are you going to do? Thank you. Anyone else? Now remember, we do have an opportunity next meeting to talk about this. So. Okay, well, thank you so much for your comment, and uh, I hope that you'll come back next meeting. Uh, we are going to change the date so, to note that um, because we normally meet on the fourth Thursday, but we're going to be changing it. So please come back on the next meeting and um, share your views again. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the consent calendar, which contains the minutes. Now, we last a meeting, we had tabled the August minutes uh, partly because we didn't have a quorum and partly because or we didn't have um, everybody wasn't here and partly because there were concerns about the um, the notes that were taken the, the minutes that were taken so tonight we are um, going to approve both August and September minutes are there any discussion points for either of those minutes um, madam chair um, I, I think the uh, minutes for our September meeting are, are an improvement of what we had in the prior meeting and I will support it. Um, I'm, 
on the, on the fence with the August 25th uh, minutes, however. Would you like us to take a separate vote for each minutes? Yes, okay. Any other comments? Okay. I also uh, agree with Mr. Jackson that the September minutes are an improvement over the August minutes, so thank you for that. And I want to also remind um, my colleagues that if there's something minutes mi missing from the minutes, we can amend them. So if you feel like there's something that didn't make it on there, uh, take a note of that and we can add them. Okay. So let's start off with the August 25th minutes. Uh, would, it, would anyone like to make a motion to approve those minutes? I'll make a motion. And we need a second, right? So second? second. Okay. And then all in, or do we take a roll call for approving the, the August minute? No. <laughs> yes, uh, let's take a um, roll call. I heard a first by board member Alvazian and a second by board member Brennan. This is just for record. Um, so we're going to take a roll call for approving the August 25th uh, fifth minutes. Um, Board member Alvazian? Yes. Board member Brennan? Approved. Board member Rochelle? Yes. Vice Chair Jackson? No. Chair Takahashi? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And would anyone like to make an, a motion to approve the September minutes? Yes, Mr. Jackson. I move that we approve the minutes for September 22nd. Uh, however, that said, there's only three of us that were at that meeting. Can we do that, Mr. City Attorney? Is that enough votes? That's a good question. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, that, that's fine. Uh, that, this action is really just for you as a body to accept the minutes as uh, presented. Okay. <clears throat> do all of us vote or just the three of us that were present? Uh, it, it is up to you. Uh, all you. All of you can vote. If you do not feel comfortable, you may abstain as well. Okay. okay, thank you. Would, uh, would one of the here, Jackson, Mr. Jackson already made the first, yes? I'll second. Second, okay, so let's take a roll call on the September minutes, please. Okay, um, so the roll call for September, the minutes, um, approving it, or sorry, modifying it. Board member Alvazian? Yes. Board member Brennan? Uh, abstain. Board member Rochelle? Abstain. Chair? Vice Chair Jackson? Yes. Chair Takashi? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have one comment before we move on to the next agenda item because it was mentioned in the minutes, not going to be any changes or anything, but um, uh, in the last meeting it was requested and it was mentioned in the minutes that uh, Mr. Hoon send out an update to the Brown Act and I just wanted to acknowledge that that update was sent to us um, regarding uh, conduct in public meetings, so I thank you for sending that to us. Um, in addition. I don't know if that needs to go into our records, but it was sent out, so I appreciate that. <laughs> He's like, how did I do that? Yes, and, and Chair, the, um, the, I think there was a notation that the uh, information was sent out uh, as part of the September 22nd minutes. Yeah, yeah at, the, at, the, at the end, right, thank you. All right, we will move on to the reports to board. The first thing we're going to do is elect the chair and vice chair, which has been put off now for two months, so we're going to hopefully do it tonight. <laughs> we are missing two people, so I did, I, I have to admit, I did uh, suggest the possibility um, to the room that, um, in the air, that uh, we uh, nominate Jeff and, I mean, Mr. Vanderbilt, <laughs> um, um, Ms. Coronado, but that would not be nice. So um, let's have a discussion about uh, who would be interested in vice chair and chair for the next year. Anyone, anyone like to start the discussion? Yes. I'd like to nominate Mr. Jackson for chair. Any other thoughts? Move the vice chair that way. Right. Move the vice chair. Any? Yeah. Can we move on then? Also, um, I'd like to nominate um, Mr. Brennan for vice chair. Okay. Do either of you have any um, opposition to those nominations? No, no, I was going to say maybe Armin. You good? Okay, anyone else have any comments? Yes? 
we need to do them separately? Uh, no, we don't need to do it separately since it seems like there's a nomination for a chair and unanimous in that nomination and also for vice chair, we could do it as one single motion, but we, we still would need a, a first and a second for that. Okay. All right, if there's no objection, then who would like to make a motion for our new chair and vice chair? I'll make the motion. Okay, second? I'll second. All right, and then how do we do the um, unanimous? Yeah. Um, we will just do roll call. Um, I heard a motion from board member Alazian and a second by board member Rochelle. Um, so we're gonna take roll call for vice chair and chair. Uh, board member Alazian? Yes. Board member Brennan? Yes. Uh, board member Rochelle? Yes. Vice chair Jackson? Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> chair Takahashi? Yes. Okay. Yay. All right, now a question. Does that take into effect from this moment on or starting next meeting? After, after this meeting. Okay, so after this meeting. Okay. Yeah, usually I leave that up to the chair. Uh, I've seen it go both ways. So. Okay. I'm fine to taking it. My tenure will probably be the shortest on record, <laughs> uh, but you know, hey, you know, that's the time we live in. You know, Britain's prime minister lasted what five weeks. I hope to last a little <laughs> longer. Uh, but whatever your pleasure is. Okay. Well, if you feel in the middle of the meeting that you'd like to switch shots, let me know. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you both for taking on these roles. Very important roles. All right, let's move on to the second item, which is the fiscal year 2021-22 Municipal Infrastructure Fund Financial Report. Who will be, oh, yes. Uh, good evening. Madam Chair, board members, uh, Finance Director Jennifer Becker will be presenting this item. Ms. Becker, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chairperson Takahashi and future Chairperson Jackson and the rest of the Infrastructure Oversight Board. I'm Jennifer Becker, the Financial Services Director, and I'm going to present to you this evening a review of our Municipal Infrastructure Fund 530, which we often refer to as Fund 534. And thank you for bringing up that presentation. Uh, just a brief look at what we'll be reviewing tonight. We're going to start with a report of our year-end revenues and expenses for the Infrastructure Fund and how it compared to our projections for the prior fiscal year. Uh, we'll take those year-end numbers and incorporate this year's budget to give you a projection of what our fund balance will be at the end of the current fiscal year. We'll look at a five-year forecast for both revenues and expenses for the infrastructure fund, and we'll talk about some of the economic factors driving those projections. And lastly, we'll take all of that information to provide you with an outlook for the upcoming fiscal year 23-24 budget and look <coughs> ahead at plans for our CIP development process. Before I go any further, I do want to point out that the city is still in the midst of our year-end financial audit. So the fiscal year 21-22 numbers you will see before you tonight are not considered final until we receive an unmodified opinion from our audit firm of Clif Clifton Larson Allen. Uh, once the audit is complete, we will issue our annual financial report, which will include all of the city's funds. Uh, we're scheduled to present that report to the city council in January. In the meantime, if you're interested in gaining a broader understanding, of the city's overall financial picture. I invite you to listen in to our fiscal year 22-23 first quarter financial report, which we will be presenting to the city council on November 15th. With that, let's begin with a look at our fund 534 revenues. Uh, the infrastructure fund has three main categories of revenues. First, as you are all well aware, uh, fund, 530 fund 534 revenues receive 50% of the city's total transactions and use tax, or TUT, revenue that was approved by Burbank voters as part of Measure P. For the most part, TUT revenue is very similar to traditional sales tax in that it's calculated on top of the goods we purchase within the city. Where it differs is in the way online sales are treated. With traditional sales tax, revenue from online sales gets pooled with the rest of the county and distributed to cities based on their proportionate share of brick and mortar sales tax. Our TUT is a local tax that is unique to Burbank and does not apply to everyone in LA County. So instead of those revenues being pooled with other cities in the county, they stay right here in Burbank. Uh, because of the shift to online sales during the pandemic, our Measure P revenues didn't experience those big negative swings in 2020 and 2021 the way traditional brick and mortar sales tax did. But like traditional sales tax, uh, it has continued to experience a healthy growth in the past year, which I'll show you in a moment. The second revenue source for the infrastructure fund is that general fund maintenance of effort or 
MOE, uh, which was established by city ordinance in 2018. <coughs> this $4.7 million annual contribution is based on a three-year history of general fund infrastructure spending prior to the passage of Measure <coughs> P and ensures that our Measure P revenues do not supplant cities, the city's previous contributions to infrastructure. Uh, despite some interest from the IOB in indexing this annual contribution to an inflationary factor, uh, the City Council for now has elected to keep that amount flat annually. However, they always have the option to contribute more from the general fund in any given fiscal year if they choose to do so. And the last revenue category is interest. Uh, like any other city fund, our infrastructure fund earns interest on its cash balance, which is a very small portion of the fund's overall revenue. There are also some one-time contributions from other funds or year-end accounting adjustments that may appear in this revenue category from time to time. Interest earnings will vary based on the size of the infrastructure fund balance as well as current interest rates. As you've probably seen in the news lately, interest rates are definitely on the rise while market earnings are trending in the other direction and we'll see both of those reflected in our revenues uh, in fiscal year 21-22. So let's take a look at our performance from the 21-22 fiscal year. Uh, this graph shows our projected revenue of $17.7 .7 on the left versus our actual revenue of $19.9 .9 on the right, an increase of nearly 11% from revenues in the prior year. Uh, there's a lot going on here, so I'll take a minute to discuss what's happening in each of our revenue categories. Uh, first, we'll start with the easy one. That green section of the bar chart represents our general fund maintenance of effort. Uh, we projected this at $4.7 million, and the general fund maintained that commitment, contributing $4.7 million to the fund in 21-22. Now, that little yellow area is our interest slash other category. And you may be wondering why that chart shows a negative number, uh, which is exactly what I asked myself when I first reviewed the results. Uh, so this negative 642,000 actually represents three numbers netted together in this category. Uh, first, Fund 534 had some healthy interest earnings of about $400,000 uh, due to its growing cash balance. Uh, second, uh, Public Works received a one-time grant reimbursement for the fiscal year 21-22 residential paving program in the amount of $300,000. Now offsetting those two revenues is a negative $1.4 million market value adjustment that was made by our accounting staff at the end of the fiscal year. So all of the city funds are pulled together into essentially one big pot that the city treasurer invests on behalf of the city to try to grow our assets um, and earn interest. Well, like everyone else who had investments in the stock market last year, the city's portfolio declined in value by about $18 million. Uh, the Government Account Accounting Standards Boards, or GASB, requires that we book any investment loss or gain at the end of each fiscal year. So that $1.4 million negative adjustment represents Fund 534's share of the city's $18 million loss. But it's important to remember that this adjustment is essentially just a paper loss. Uh, the city and its funds don't realize any actual gains or losses until such time as the treasurer chooses to cash out those investments that she has. So lastly and most importantly, uh, let's discuss those Measure P TUT revenues, which are represented by the big blue section on the chart. Uh, Fund 534's 50% share of TUT revenues outperformed expectations by $3 million in fiscal year 21-22, increasing by nearly 23% over prior year revenues. Uh, we projected a significant amount of recovery coming out of the pandemic in 2021, and we definitely saw that with Burbank's restaurants and hotels back in full swing and the return to shopping at brick and mortar stores. What we did not predict back in May 2021 when we adopted this budget was how significant the impact of inflation would be on this city's revenue stream. As the prices of goods rise, so do sales tax revenues. And this is particularly evident in categories like auto sales where, where they've experienced uh, supply chain issues, as well as fuel and service stations, uh, which experienced record prices in recent months due to the war in Ukraine, in addition to rising revenues uh, with the airport back in full swing and once again uh, purchasing fuel. Uh, while it is great for our revenues in the short term, uh, we do know that the flip side of inflation is that it also <coughs> impacts the cost of everything we buy. So we'll need to be mindful of that as we move towards developing next year's budget. Now let's flip to our Fund 534 expenses. 
As you are probably aware, we have two main categories of budgeted expenses in the infrastructure fund. The first is our annual maintenance, which is reflected in the materials, supplies, and services, or MSNS portion of the budget. Uh, both public works and park and recreation have budgeted maintenance in their funds, uh, which covers any routine non-capital work such as plumbing repairs, electrical, HVAC services, uh, park facility and ball field maintenance, tree trimming, and weed, weed abatement. Uh, the other category is our capital budget, which is determined by our annual capital improvement program, or CIP. Our CIP is made up of two types of projects. We have our annual or recurring CIP, which are the things we do on a cyclical basis, like street paving, roof or flooring replacement, upgrading irrigation at our parks, uh, replacing playground equipment, or any other types of capital improvements that are part of our regular routine. Then we also have one-time capital projects, which are more standalone. Uh, they may involve building a new facility or a major renovation to an existing facility the City Yard Services Building or the Maxim Park Restroom and Multipurpose Room Renovation are examples of projects that are more one-time in nature. So let's take a look now at our actual expenditures during the fiscal year compared to our original fiscal year 21-22 budget. Out of a total of Fund 534 budget of roughly $16.3 million, the City spent approximately $11.4 million or about 70%. Our maintenance spending, represented by the red area, was at about 98% of budget, which is right on target for where we expect our spending to be at the end of the year. Our capital spending for the fiscal year was just shy of $7 million, compared to an adopted capital spending plan of $11.7 million. I should note that this report includes only dollars that were fully expended in fiscal year 21-22. There is another $3.5 million of Fund 534 that were awarded or encumbered for specific projects last fiscal year, but were not yet actually expended as of June. As part of the annual budget adoption, any capital project not completed at the end of the fiscal year automatically carries over into the next year so that work may continue on all of the city's budgeted capital projects uninterrupted. So now, Taking all those fiscal year 21-22 year-end results that we just reviewed, we can determine our year-end fund balance from last year and project forward to our available fund balance at the end of the current year. So we started on July 1st, 2021 with $26.6 million in Fund 534. Uh, we received a total of $19.9 million in revenues in the past year, and we had $11.4 million in expenditures. Additionally, we carried over another $18.2 million in existing budgeted capital projects into the new fiscal year. Uh, this left us with a balance of $16.9 million as of June 30, 2021, which I will remind the board is still technically an unaudited financial uh, year-end balance. Point two. Yeah. And, and point two. Sorry, yes, yeah. as of June 30, 2022, my mistake. Yeah. So. We can take that $16.9 million that we ended the year with, and that's our beginning balance in the current fiscal year. Uh, we add to that our projected 21-22 revenues of $19.8 million and subtract our 21-22 adopted Fund 534 budget of $18.3 million. Additionally, you will remember last month that we took $10 million of our fund balance and placed it in a reserve for the Civic Center project so that it could be utilized as a source of matching funds for potential grants. After taking this action, we are still left with a projected available fund balance of $8.4 million at the end of the current fiscal year. So overall, our municipal infrastructure fund is in a very healthy place, leaving the city well positioned to continue to fund all of our routine work in addition to some of the bigger capital needs that are on the horizon. And with that, let's look towards the future of our five-year forecast, starting with revenues. Uh, looking on the left, those first two columns. <laughs> I apologize. Is the, I think there is a confusion. Yeah, the handout um, needed to be updated, I believe, right? Am I, are we all looking at the same thing on slide eight? Yes. Or did we update it? Do you guys, because I showed it. Right, so in the yes. handout, right, we need to point out the clarification. The, I apologize, yes, I submitted a oh, correction. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, because when I originally uh, ran these calculations, I did not include the $10 million that was set aside for the library, so I show that total is 18 instead of eight. So uh, that's so slide the discrepancy. Eight. So going back that's here, the correct one. Yeah, I had the same 8.4 thing. million is the total. So Technically it is 18 million because those civic center funds are in a reserve that's readily right. available, but um, this is just me doing poor math. Mm -hmm. All right, so is it eight? 
it's it's eight because our handout didn't subtract the ten million okay. out, but oh, hers is correct. Okay. My Thank apologies. you. Thank you. So let's look at that five-year forecast with revenues. Uh, the two columns on the left represent the last two fiscal years for which we have final results, uh, followed by fiscal year 22-23, which is our current budget year. Uh, the remaining columns with those more muted colors are projections for the next five years. As shown on the chart, we expect that we'll exceed 20 million in revenue for the first time in fiscal year 23-24. And we expect steady but conservative growth in, growth in each subsequent year, increasing to about 23 million in fiscal year 27-28. Uh, this is largely driven by the growth in our measured P transactions and use tax, shown in blue. After truing up our TUT revenue estimates to reflect last year's better than expected results, we are projecting modest growth of about 2.5% per year in the remaining years of our forecast. Now, given how uh, last year's revenues outperformed projections by nearly three million, it is possible that our future projections are still low, and as such, we'll continue to con track actual results and refine our forecast throughout the year, especially leading into our uh, budget development period. Uh, flipping over to expenses, so this chart shows our actual spending for the past two years, our current 22-23 budget, and our known future spending out through 27-28. Uh, the red represents our maintenance spending, while the orange represents capital spending. Uh, you can see how we approved minimal spending in our capital program during fiscal year 2021, when so little was known about the potential impacts of the pandemic. Uh, but we are back in full swing with a very robust spending plan for the current fiscal year, which is 22-23. Uh, we've made some assumptions about future year budgets, estimating a modest growth in our maintenance budget, and assuming that the city will continue with its annual capital programming for items like street paving, sidewalks, park irrigation, playground replacements, et cetera. Uh, so that striped area on those right-hand columns represents the annual funds that we will have available for future capital projects after accounting for all of our annual needs, uh, with about 7.2 million available to address one-time capital needs in the upcoming 23-24 budget, uh, growing to almost 8.3 million in 27-28. And a portion of these funds will also likely be the source of future recurring expenses for the new Civic Center project as well. So in speaking of the upcoming budget, let's do a little sneak peek of what the board can expect for the 23-24 CIP budget development process. Uh, we estimate that we'll start the year with an $8.4 million fund balance in Fund 534, which does not include that $10 million sitting in the Civic Center Reserve. My apologies. I think we need to go forward one more. Oh. Oh, no, it's so the right slide? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm ahead then. My apologies. That's okay. Uh, right now, we project to receive about $21.4 million in total revenue for 23-24. Uh, this is based on an assumed 2.5% increase in TUT from prior year actuals. But like I mentioned, we may update those projections uh, before the budget cycle, depending on how uh, TUT performs in the month ahead. Of those revenues, we assume that our annual maintenance and capital spending plan will take up about 14.2 million 14 .2 in budgeted expenses. This leaves us with about 7.2 million in available for one-time CIP projects, not including that available uh, fund balance of 8.4 million that we're projecting at the end of the year. So there's great opportunity to put together another ambitious infrastructure plan for next fiscal year while still retaining the ability to set aside funds for large future endeavors like the Civic Center project or one of uh, Burbank's many other capital needs. Taking a look at the timeline for our budget development process as it pertains to our capital improvement program, our various city departments will submit their CIP funding requests for the 23-24 fiscal year to Public Works in December. Uh, each of these projects will be reviewed by staff and given a prioritization score according to the criteria previously established by this board, and then matched up with the appropriate funding sources to develop our full proposed infrastructure plan. Uh, the plan will be presented at the IOB at the February 23rd meeting, and we'll take whatever feedback we receive from the board at that time to revise our plan and present it again for approval on March 23rd. <clears throat> On May 3rd, we plan to distribute the full proposed citywide 23-24 budget, uh, which of course will include our capital improvement program. 
On May 16th, we'll present the CIP budget to the City Council for their review and feedback. And if all goes well, we will hold our public hearing and adopt our fiscal year 23-24 budget on June 13th. So this concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions that the board may have at this time. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Becker. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Mr. Jackson. Thank you for the presentation. It was very informative, especially about brackets, because I, I learned some time ago from my stock portfolio, which is rather small, <laughs> about this thick. Anyway, that brackets are not a good thing. Uh, the question about the I guess you call, Prop P, you're calling it transaction and use tax, mm -hmm. and we've, we're raking in more money. Uh, which is good uh, for the city uh, because of the economy recovering from the pandemic. Um, major sources, as you pointed out, I think were autos and uh, other big ticket items and then also uh, food and uh, restaurants and, and, and other sources. My question is, what about internet sales? Does the city, I assume the city gets that. Do, do you have specific numbers on internet sales? Uh, and uh, is that expanded? Uh, yes, well internet sales of course is, is part of that transactions and use tax. So it's, it's part of the revenue that we reported. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head about what we did in internet sales. Um, depending on what you order from the internet, it's categorized in different ways. The, the way our sales tax is reported is by different uh, categories. For example, general consumer goods is one category. Obviously, as we see the price of goods, goods rise, uh, that includes internet sales and those prices rise as well. Uh, autos and transportation is another category, uh, food and hotels like you mentioned. So each of those things we've seen a pretty substantial increase uh, across the board. Uh, I don't know that online sales is necessarily outpacing any of the others. I think it's almost the other way around because we saw online sales spike during the pandemic and now they've kind of leveled off and what you're seeing is the restaurants, uh, the in-store shopping, the autos, the fuel is, is sort of catching up. I, I should include uh, business as well. There's been a lot of business to business sales that were sort of on hold during the pandemic and as the studios and all of our many businesses in Burbank are ramping up activity, uh, we're seeing increases in uh, sales tax revenue from those items as well. So it, it's really a, an across the board increase. Uh, of course, we're very pleased about that, but we also realize that, you know, 20% annual increases are not sustainable, which is why I'm, you know, not forecasting that we're going to continue at that rate. Um, you know, we don't want to see that either. We, we hope inflation sort of stabilizes a little bit and, and you want to see steady growth in your revenues, but anytime you see extreme growth, you, you worry that it's going to head in the other direction. So uh, slow and steady is uh, what we always hope for. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other comments or questions? No? Okay. Um, so I have a couple questions. Thank you. So I'm curious, um, on page four, you were looking, uh, showing us how we are, we received more than expected um, revenue from the um, Measure P taxes. I'm wondering if, has it reached the pre-pandemic pre level yet, or is it still, yeah? Yes, we have per, uh, surpassed pre-pandemic levels uh, in both the TUT and in traditional sales tax. Wow, that's great. So that we never saw much of a dip in the transactions and use tax. And I think that's just because of the strength of online sales and how all of the TUT from online sales made in Burbank stays here in Burbank. Mm -hmm. So that sort of boosted that revenue stream, whereas sales tax has... Uh, took a bit of a dip, uh, and but of course now is back, and yes, we've surpassed uh, pre-pandemic levels. Wow, great news. Yes. And then um, during that part of the presentation, you also mentioned the investments, and you uh, alluded to that we have the investment, but it's not, it's paper, it's on paper only because it's 
really tucked in there until the treasurer decides to pull it out for use. What would be an occasion that that would happen? Has it happened? And what, what would, how would that happen? I mean, typically, no. So yeah. the majority of the treasurer's funds are invested in uh, LAIF or in things that are much more conservative. We don't put 100% of the city's funds in the market or in any one place. You would never do that when you're investing assets. Uh, regardless, so we have this giant cash portfolio that's made up of all of the funds together. And when it increases in value, we get a positive market value adjustment that we're required to make at the end of the year. And when it decreases, we get a negative. So really, um, every year there's some amount of adjustment, but it's going to be different from year to year depending on how the markets do. I can tell you that the market value adjustment for the year before, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it was greater than the 1.4 million loss we experienced this year. So each year you're going to see something different, and you know that's just part of investing, right? Not every year is going to be a banner year, but this was, um, you know, a bigger loss than the typic than the city typically experiences. Okay. Uh, just as we all know, it's been a, a tough year for the market all around. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, moving a little down a bit, um, comparing 2021-22 um, fiscal year and the 2022-23, um, <clears throat> I'm just curious uh, why you expect there's a slight dip in expected revenue for mm -hmm. the second year. I'm just curious why. It's, it's a small dip, so it's really not that significant, but I'm just curious why it changed downward rather uh, than upward. That's a great question. So when we uh, do our budget for the current fiscal year, uh, we make our projections based on a percentage increase from the prior year. So uh, as you know, our prior year projections were 17.7 .7 million in revenue. So we took that 17.7, projected a healthy growth on top of that, and that's what we assumed we would receive for 21-22. So that budget's already adopted in May. Then at the end of June, when we look at our actual revenues for the prior fiscal year, we see that they came in higher than we even projected in the current year. So probably at some point during this current fiscal year, uh, we'll go back to council and adjust those revenue projections for this year up a little bit more because we know we're low, right? We projected 19.8 and we already received 19.9 in the prior year. So we'll want to true that up a little bit during the course of the year, but um, as you note from the chart it says budgeted so that is what we took to council and approved as part of the budget which is why it's uh we didn't change it yet because i haven't officially uh revised the revenue projections for this year got it makes sense and then on those same slides um so the beginning fund balance in J july of 21 was 26.6 million mm -hmm. and then the ending balance of the year was 16.9 and then the following year eight it's going down each year. Should we be concerned? <laughs> uh, we should not. So that 26.6 was a pretty big exception. Okay. And that's because everything stopped as a result of the pandemic. Uh, your total budget for the fund is only $18 million roughly per year. So a $26.6 million fund balance basically means we've chosen not to expend any of our revenues or appropriate any of our revenues because we didn't know uh, what was going to happen with the pandemic on the horizon, right? We budgeted very little in that year, and we assumed a bigger revenue loss than we actually received. So uh, we, we we had that 26 million, but then of course, you know, we carried over all the existing projects. Uh, we then went and did a normal budget as we should be doing, and and uh, ended with a 16.9 million dollar fund balance. Uh, of course, ha had it not been for the 10 million that we set aside for the civic center our fund balance would have been 18 million, right? So it grew from year to year, uh, which is still uh, very good. So an eight, point, an $8 million fund balance for a budget that's only $18 million per year is pretty substan substantial. Uh, by comparison, you know, if you look at the general fund, uh, your fund balance is, gonna, you're lucky if it's gonna be 10 or 20% of the total budget. So we're in a very good place with Fund 534. The balance is growing on an annual basis, which is great. Uh, we have yet to have a year where we've expended more than we received in revenues, so that balance will continue to grow, and, and that's what it's there for, right, for the future capital needs of the city. Great. Thank you. A couple more. So um, on the projections out for the future years, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that. It's, it's, I like to see the future projections. Um, so we have a number of large-scale projects coming in, you know, mixed-use buildings, and I'm sure there will be more to follow. 
because of our housing needs, right? And that also includes business and more sales tax potentially from those businesses. And I'm wondering if that is that factored in, is that growth of our city population and potentially business growth as well factored into this projection forward and those potential sales tax increases? Or are you waiting to see until things kind of shape up before you add them in? So yes and no. Uh, business growth doesn't impact sales taxes as much as uh, other things. So when we're talking about housing developments or, or new developments in the city, that really impacts property tax quite a bit, right? Because we're increasing the value on all of these properties in which we build those developments. So we'll see that there in the forecast when we look at our overall general fund forecast. Uh, with sales tax, it's really iffy, right? Because it depends on the price of goods. It depends on sort of consumer spending. Uh, so we kind of landed at that 2.5%, you know, assuming that we're going to see some economic growth, but also tempering for the fact that it's very well that prices could stabilize. I, I'd be surprised if they came back down, but that it's likely that prices will stabilize as inflation comes to an end. Uh, people will get more conservative. You know, we hear lingering about the recession, about are we entering a potential re recession? I don't know if that's the case. Uh, typically, you don't know until you're already a few months into one. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're sort of tempering those expectations and kind of landing somewhere in the middle with sales tax. But you will see growth in other categories as the city adds population or develops housing and, and those sorts of things. Great. Well, you answered my second question in that answer, so thank you. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> that's all I've got for this. So thank you very much. Anyone, any more last questions that came up during that discussion? No? Okay, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Great. Okay, good. Thank you for all the hard work you put into this, this budget and ready for anything we ask. Really appreciate that. All right, next up is the Police Fire Headquarters Flooring Project Update. Who will be presenting that tonight? This should be very interesting. Mr. Hahn, are you ready? I see this for a while. Thank you, Mr. Berkman. We need that elevator music in the beginning. All right, Simpsons. Okay. Here we go. Good evening, Chair Takahashi and members of the board. Hoon Han with Public Works. Tonight I have before you the PD Fire Headquarter for a project update. The purpose of this presentation is to address some questions that were brought forth by the board members regarding the costs associated with this project. The goal of this presentation is to review the cost breakdown <coughs> for the project, to total project budget. Uh, due to the sensitivity, sensitive nature of the building, uh, detailed information of the building cannot be shared with the public. But, however, I can give some general information regarding the building and how the project <coughs> was put together. So the building was completed and dedicated in early 1998. The total floor area is approximately 120,000 square feet, <coughs> comprising of seven different finishes. The average unit cost to resurface the floor is <coughs> $7.25. The total construction cost, based on the square footage and the unit cost, comes out to be $872,494, sorry, <laughs> with the anticipated inspection cost of nearly $70,000 thus making the total project cost close to $950,000. The average unit cost at $7.25 includes not only material, but also demolition, um, night work that's associated with the project, and the cost for night work is usually higher. Uh, the project is being phased, so the, the cost will go up with that also and staff relocation, uh, which may require temporary workstations and IT support. And due to the sensitive nature of the 24-7 operations, uh, we may consider, we are in count, we may, we're anticipating some unforeseen conditions that we're gonna run into during construction. 
So as, as a result, a 20% contingency has been built into the unit cost. The, and a full-time inspector is required at all times during construction for security reasons. So we can't have the contractor kind of roaming around at, on the site by themselves. And lastly, the contractor will be allowed will only be allowed to remove the material they can replace in a given work period. So whatever they're gonna do that night, whatever they remove, we have to make sure they put it back so the, the police station could be in operation in the morning. Um, as, a, as you can see, the unit cost is not just for the material, but other factors are considered when putting the project estimate together. In prior years, um, Appropriation of three hundred fifty thousand dollars is from uh, Fund Five. I'm sorry, Fund Three Seventy General Fund. Uh, of this, ninety-seven thousand one hundred eighty-six dollars have been spent to date on carpet cleaning and for floor condition assessment study uh, to determine the floor conditions and how we're going to phase the uh, uh, the work out there. Uh, we have two hundred fifty-two thousand eight hundred fourteen dollars of the three hundred fifty thousand available. Uh, the total project budget required, as I stated earlier, uh, is approximately $950,000. Uh, based on these numbers, we need additional $690,000 to complete this project. So, so far, uh, we have additional $210,000 that was appropriated for fiscal year 21-22. Uh, I'm sorry, for 22-23. And, and we will be seeking additional funds for this project in the next uh, two budget cycles. Uh, as indicated in the es estimated project funding above. Um, currently, staff is working with purchasing and securing contract on the first phase of the project, and this phase will replace the hallway carpets and any additional things that uh, we could achieve with the uh, leftover funds. And the second phase of the project is scheduled to go out to bid in the spring of 2023, and the first phase will kind of give us an indication how the project's gonna flow and the coordination effort that we have to put with the uh, with police and fire, because it is a 24-7 uh, building. And that concludes my presentation, and I am available to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Han. Do we have any questions? Yes, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Han, for making this presentation. Um, I, I think I've probably been questioning this expenditure the most uh, than my colleagues. Um, I, I looked in my file of, of uh, our prior meetings, and back in February and March, the capital improvement project request for this states the project description is a four-phase project that will replace approximately 10,000 square feet of flooring. And so I used that number against the cost and came up with you know, an astronomical over $100 a square foot. However, in the report that you presented to us today, you say that the building consists of approximately 112,000 square feet. So I, I assume this, the, the building hasn't grown, but that uh, what we had back in February on this, this uh, capital improvement list possibly was, was not accurate. Is that, is that what happened? That would be correct. Okay, so the ten thousand really would been a hundred thousand, probably closer to the mark. I see. Yes. Okay. Um, well, then that pretty much explains, you know, my concern. If you factor it, you know, ten times uh, the area uh, divided by the cost. I do have a question. In your report, you talk about the. Engineer's estimate for four replacement is $872,000. Uh, who is the engineer that made this in, uh, uh, estimate? Is this in-house, is it a member of staff that's a cost estimator, or is it an outside consultant, or do you have a big dartboard in your office that you come up with these numbers? I'm, I'm curious, not you know for this case, but also you know in general all you know the CIP Problems that were presented that have obviously a, you know, a t dollar tag. You know how do you arrive at those numbers? Yeah. So the study that was put together um, that actually helps uh, the the architect that put the study together put some dollar fa uh, 
values to the material. Uh, based on that, uh, they didn't really consider all the uh, coordination effort, relocation of staff, and the other part of it. The um, so based on our experience, so we as far as the the estimate, it was put together in house. Uh, based on our expertise and, and our experience of work and what it may uh, require as far as the workload. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, we looked at the actual cost of the material, looked at what the, uh, the effort, uh, looked at the, the, re the report itself and also the, the effort that it may require to uh, do the work. So like I said before, um, after the first phase, first two phase, I think we're gonna get a really good idea of the, the flow of the project and how it's gonna go. Uh, I have a feeling that the cost adjustment will probably get adjusted as the project goes. And I'm hoping that the price will come down, it will flow better, and uh, the, the anticipated, the coordination effort or staff relocation will be a lot less effort than, than we anticipate. So, so we do have on staff people who have the expertise to come up with these numbers uh, for this and for the other uh, projects we have. Okay, I find that it good to know. I mean, just on a personal note, my father was a cost estimator for the Bank of America and people come in wanting millions of dollars for building something and he would go over the plans and look at the you know specs and come up with a figure that he thought was reasonable and uh, then they would go further on that uh, negotiation. Okay. Board Member Jackson, yes. uh, through the chair, may I? It's a great um, question and, and very briefly to provide some information for the board and, and for the public. Um, two things, one, every staff member within uh, Public Works and our engineering division have different um, levels of experience and expertise and capital improvement project backgrounds um, so the projects that are assigned are appropriate to the level of experience of the engineer. Some are very complex and those go to our senior staff. Some are more um, routine or um, e easy to negotiate, if you will, as far as takeoffs and cost estimates. So we have different uh, plans for every type of project. And um, the other part, the level of the cost estimate depends on what level uh, or, or what part of the project we are in. If we were in a, a high level, like first planning, um, uh, first flush of scope of work, this could be a good example of, I don't know if this happened, but hey, we want to refloor the entire PD building. What do you think an estimate is? So we'll pull a number and try and program it to make sure that's in the program in a conservative estimate with a large contingency. And as we go through the process where we identify the logistics of things, we iron out that cost estimate over the course of, of however long it takes, could be fiscal year, multiple fiscal years like this project, until we have what could be called a, a class A estimate where we have a 10% contingency, we know the exact square feet, we have all these um, outside of just time and materials uh, issues in PD, for example, ironed out. So um, that two-pronged approach of the right staff assigned with the right expertise and ironing out the um, specificity of the cost estimate as we go uh, is definitely something we do and, and perhaps it's something we can talk about as we go through our development of the capital program this coming year. Yeah, and, and the challenge with when we're budgeting for a project is because we don't have a design. So we're, we're kind of anticipating the work that's going to be required to do the work. So the project manager, as we're putting numbers together, we kind of have to try to build the project in on paper and see how it's going to go and the flow of it, what it might take. Um, like I shared with you earlier, the 20% contingency is because there are a lot of unknowns for this because it's a 24-7 building. Uh, the coordination effort, we don't quite understand exactly what that's going to entail yet. But once we get in there, I think we have a better understanding of what it's going to take. So when we come back in February, all the projects that when we're budgeting, so one of the requirements, the project managers, when we're budgeting for it, they have to build it out on paper, kind of think through the process, what is it going to take to actually budget for that? And it is a challenge. Um, it's something um, I think most people have a, when I actually first started in capital, I had a hard time grasping it. Uh, my supervisor said, hey, put a project budget together. And I'm like, uh, how do I do that? Uh, I don't have a plan. I don't, how do I do the takeoff? And, so it's, it's kind of a, it's a process that we have to develop and learn. 
Uh, so it's something, um, so it is a challenge, so we do the best that we can. Uh, but when we actually go bid it out, then we, as the project develops and moves along, we get a better idea what that unit costs and what the cost will be. Okay, uh, just one final comment. Uh, I appreciate that, and my comfort level has increased dramatically. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Brennan and I served on the school bond oversight committee for a number of years. And as we got into the process, we learned quite to our, at least my surprise, and I think also Mr. Brennan's, that the numbers that were initially put forward to the voters on, on the different improvements were not very refined. I mean, they, school officials are, you know, teachers and administrators, and, you know, but they didn't necessarily have the expertise to come up with the numbers. But uh, now what I hear this evening uh, makes me you know, more comfortable. Thank you very much, and I think my colleagues also have questions. Yeah, Mr. Uh, yeah, Ms. Michelle. It, in your experience, Mr. Um, Han, isn't 20 percent for a contingency, isn't that a bit high, isn't it? Yes, actually, I, I would agree it is high, but like I said, because of the, the facility, it's a 24-7 facility, it's an infill project, uh, so it's, we, we don't know what to expect. I think we're, there are going to be a lot of unforeseen conditions, situations that we have to deal with. Uh, one of the thing is uh, the jail. Um, I don't know exactly how we're going to resurface that because it's an operation jail that needs, operates 24-7. It's not like we could, so that part we haven't even really figured out, out the details of that yet. So when we come to that, I think when we iron those things out, we're going to notice the maybe 20% wasn't enough. I'm not sure. So, so we'll see how it goes. But I think first phase, we're going to knock off the hallways first, the easy thing. And then we're going to kind of venture into the, uh, the staff areas. And there's also the, uh, the, the 911 center. That's a 24-7 operation. So I'm not sure. There may be some coordination efforts with other agencies that may transfer. So there's a lot of details that we haven't really ironed out yet, but uh, we will get to that. And uh, if I may add, um, one of the things that you would typically see when we go to contract award with the city council <clears throat> is a 10% contingency for construction. But if we go underground uh, trenching or anything like that, it's typically 15%. <coughs> yes, different types of flooring that we worked out, which is great to know that there's that many. <coughs> then the question is, presuming you're going to, you're going to have contractors bid on this project, maybe a general with subcontractors can do each of the seven uh, concepts you have here, which brings to mind, um, who's writing the specifications for the contractors to bid on? So the, the first phase right now, we have a... Um, the procurement process is what's it's called a cooperative agreement contract. Uh, what the city's going to do is piggyback off an existing contract another agency has used. So, um, so we're in the process of executing the contract with the material supplier, and then they're going to bring in a contractor, and then we're going to coordinate with them for the first oh, phase of it. Wait a minute. <laughs> Seriously? In. Yes, sir. The, the job order contracting is something that's used by many cities, and it's a great way to do something that is uh, simple and routine, like flooring, and also gain the benefit of the bids from the economy of scale, because we're basically partnering with other agencies, so our relatively small flooring project becomes a very big project, and that's the way the contractors bid on it. It's almost like a, a city conglomerate on call if you will, um, but the specs are um, prepared by professionals and in their industry standards that all licensed flooring contractors know and operate by. So the uh, manufacturers are going to pick the flooring contractors for the various items that I see uh, listed here, and they're going to bid this to you. The, the manufacturers through their contractors are going to bid this through to you. It's, and there's it's, no overall... Uh -huh. There's a consultant that's managing these folks to make sure they don't get out of hand? Well, we will be managing it in-house. We have a project manager that's going to be managing the project. Uh, the unit cost is set 
by this cooperative agreement. So the the there isn't a so play. How many agents, I mean, sorry, I hate to break in, uh, interrupt you, but how many agencies are involved besides the PD for this project? How many agencies? As it sounds in, like you said you have you're cooperating with other cities and or agencies to do these kind of things. So how many other agencies or cities are involved with putting these projects together? I, I don't know how many agencies per se, but it's a it's a um, I'm not really, I don't know the, the, the details of the cooperative agreement. It's uh, something that purchasing is going to helping us procure. And our city purchasing, I gotta say, they're pretty, pretty good about making sure the city of Burbank gets the best price and the guest contract. Okay. They work with us with uh, Public Works and we get a lot of hand slap little bit back, you know, telling us to back off or get more information to them so that they could do a job, you know, that uh, represents the city well. Uh, as to answer your question as far as the design, um, we, the, the study that was performed that we've already paid for has an outline of the different types of materials. Who did that for you? An architect. Okay. Well, who's the architect? Uh, I, I don't recall who that was. Um, it's okay. M, it, it, so they went through a procurement process. The, the report sure was put did, together yeah. several years ago. Um, so it um, hasn't been updated, but I would say the information is there pretty thorough, but I can't really share it. It has a little bit too much information on there, uh, like the floor plan and everything, so it's not sure. something I could share with the general public. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, there's a lot of unknown in this, in this yeah. project because of the sensitivity of the, uh, the building itself. Um, so once we get going, I think we're going to get a really good idea of how it's going to flow, how it's going to go. Uh, like I said, the, we have a project manager that's going to be managing it for us. Uh, that's an internal staff, and there, where he, she's working with purchasing right now. Um, and, and hopefully we'll get that contract executed relatively soon. No, it's not. It's a. It's under finance, actually. They they are independent of Public Works. So they're they're. I gotta say, uh, I. They're very thorough. Yes, extremely thorough. Yeah. <laughs> so, you write the specs, and you do the inspection, along with all the agencies that you work with, correct? Well, we, we're not working with other agencies in this project in the sense the, the, the I, I feel like if I get into, try to explain the cooperative agreement, I'm, I think I'm gonna probably butcher it. Um, maybe okay. we need to come back one day and un, you know, maybe uh, go over through the process, invite a purchasing representative to kind of go over that That'd and explain great. that. That would uh, be very helpful because it seems really confusing. Yeah, uh, it's, I it's, know we waited so long. <clears throat> it's a to new get this kind of breakdown. The breakdown's good, and then to a, a step further in the process, you know, some of us, for example, uh, like myself, work with Kaiser Hospitals all over uh, California and Western United States, and doing projects just like this. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you don't have a. You, it just seems a little different. Yeah. No, I understand what you're saying as far as the you know, uh, the the cooperative agreement. It's. Something new for me also uh, with this agency. I know that there are more agencies getting involved in, in, in contracts like this. Uh, it does help expedite and it actually gives us probably a better unit price also. Probably. So overall it's a win-win. Um, so like I said, I think, uh, I think the more I try to explain it, I'm sure I'm gonna butcher yeah. it and <laughs> lead you down the wrong yeah. path. You got a really good price for what, you, knowing what those kind of buildings look like on the inside seems like you got a pretty good overall price if it sticks. Yeah. Have seen the inside of the jail? Say again? <laughs> no, 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 I haven't seen the inside of the jail. Um, not, not a civilian jail, military jail, <laughs> what those look like. Thank you, Mr. Hahn. You're welcome. Great questions. Any other comments or questions? You, answer, you asked all the questions I had too, so <laughs> okay. um, thank you so much for this presentation and um, this breakdown. It was. Um, I, an item that Mr. Jackson, I believe, was asking for, and and so I appreciate we appreciate you bringing it in and explaining. And I and I you know I think 
periodically having this kind of detailed discussion about different projects is helpful as well, just for the exact reason that Mr. Brennan was asking questions about procurement and, and, and cooperative agreements that, that comes out of these discussions about the particular projects. So I appreciate you bringing in examples and walking us through each, you know, kind of over time walking us through the different ones. It, it's helpful for us and the public, I think, to understand. So thank you. Okay. All right, next up is the exciting um, agenda item of rescheduling our November and December meetings for the holidays. Because I, I think our November meeting actually de would have normally fallen on Thanksgiving, is that right? Yeah. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, board members, um, as you just mentioned, our November and December meetings, given the last, uh, the fourth Thursday of the month, uh, is Thanksgiving in November, and uh, this year also around uh, Christmas. I was looking to, um, while staff sets the meeting schedules, we wanted confirmation with you that like the last couple of years, it seemed, uh, if I'm doing it right here, the second Thursday seemed to have worked, so that's why December 8th is suggested for the board to consider. Is everyone available on the 8th? Yes. Yeah, me too. I mean, we do have to ask our other two colleagues who aren't here, I suppose, just to confirm it'd be helpful to have them as well. But it um, looks like we all here can make it on the 8th, so it's a good date. Okay, noted, thank you very much. All right, thank you. All right, so we're moving on to H, introduction of additional items, agenda items, and to note that we already have a few coming up in our November, December meeting. It's slated to talk about the upcoming um, BRT, bus rapid transit project that was mentioned by our, our speaker earlier and then a first and second quarter report um, so does anyone have any items that they would like to request to um, add additional agenda items uh, madam chair staff will add a future agenda item to uh, have a presentation on job order contracting i think we could add that that would be helpful that's great i was going to ask about that great i was also um wanted to ask my colleagues about um, part of the presentation um, by Ms. Becker was uh, the calendar of our budgeting. And she mentioned that in December and January and February is when the staff comes together and different departments come together and you hash out your internally your um, um, projects that you'll be presenting in the budget, um, infrastructure budget projects. And I'm wondering if maybe in December, if we could add December, November, um, add a, an agenda item for us as a, a, a body to be able to present items from the unfunded list that we th would like for you pot potentially to consider to discuss internally first. So that way it's discussed amongst you in that meeting rather than waiting until we get the proposed list and then we say, well, what about X, Y, Z? Why wasn't that discussed? So if we get ahead of it and ask in the December, Janu uh, November, December meeting and just let you know which ones we're interested in hearing more about and possibly adding to the list and then you can let us know where that, you know, in the later on what you thought when you considered it. What do you, what do you all think about that? I think that's a good idea. Yeah, Madam Chair, uh, board members, what we can do is, um, you might recall, we did prioritize that list in a category one, two, three, correct? So um, could be helpful to have you uh, go over the list. And when we have our discussions with the departments, because they also, of course, look at the list, uh, it'll be good for them to have your feedback in advance. Great. Can we make it general enough that we can... Um make just have like um i don't know how to phrase it but to be able to say these are the ones that are we're interested in taking a look at or maybe reprioritizing yeah something as simple as um consideration of the unfunded projects list um for the fiscal year 23 24 capital program perfect great thank you all right and Pending, okay, so anything else for additional additional agenda items? Okay, great. So we have our pending agenda items in November, December, I mentioned earlier. Um, I also, in, for the future, just to hold a workshop to discuss and further define the role of the IOB. Um, that's still on here. I don't know. We haven't discussed this in a while. Is this still a pending agenda item? Can you please give us a little bit of an update of this and what your thoughts are on that item? or what our thoughts are on that item. I, I, it's been a while since we discussed it, so I just want to make sure that we're, we still want to do that. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was Mr. Vandenberg 
who brought up the issue. Um, okay. I don't know of the time passage of time whether this is that relevant, but I think Jeff would be best to speak on it. Okay, so let's hold it, I guess, then until next meeting, and then he can let us know whether he wants to keep it on there. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Fair. Uh, right, Madam Chair, yes. Uh, I know we. I didn't want to uh, make the comment in advance of the meeting because I didn't know if it was what was going to happen. But I just wanted to thank you for your leadership uh, as the chair the past year before we adjourn. So thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to work with you all. I will continue to work with you next month, but it would be a pleasure to work with you all as the chair. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for a wonderful meeting again tonight, and have a great night. And the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>